I am joined today by Ken Zone. Many of you know him as Kenny Dykstra. Kenny, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thank you for having me. You, you've you had a busy last like year as it pertains to pro wrestling. You've been a little bit of everywhere. Oh, man, we've been all over. We've been very fortunate. We've been uh, Australia, Ireland, England. Tomorrow I'm actually leaving for Germany. And then the end of the month I'll be in Canada. So, And then all over in between in, in the States. So your your 2016, I, I don't want to say return because you it, you you were in Chikara, you've done some things here and there, but you you appeared on SmackDown, and then I'm seeing you like Rev Pro, House of Hardcore, Ring of Honor. What has that been like after being out of the the national spotlight for so long? Um, it's interesting. There's more there's more creative control on our end, and it kind of happened really fast because it was just you know we were we we're getting booked for WWE out of nowhere literally out of nowhere and then you know you, you never want to you get nervous when that first happens because our thought process was simply you know we could make more money on the indies if we do this while we're on tv but at the same time not that the indies isn't safe but just sometimes you might not know who you're working and what if something happens you know matches aren't as structured the same as they are in wwe there's there's a lot more high flying there's a lot more people who want to do different things different styles which is great so we weren't, you know, we were a little concerned, like, do we do it? Because what if we get hurt and then we can't do this? Are they going to sign us? In the end, they never ended up signing us, and it was the right move on our part anyways to keep going with independence. So did you see your, your bookings increase, like, substantially because of that run? Oh, absolutely, yeah. The first time, I, you know, I just put out little pressers just to, like, some local indies in the New England area. Just let them know we're available, and they just boom, boom, boom immediately. And that's when I realized, okay, maybe we have something here. And, you know, it was tough, too, because the squad at first, you know, the Spirit Squad had this, like, stigma to it of, like, oh, it's such a gimmick. It's such, you know, what it was. But now it was our turn to make it into our own, and that's why now we go by the squad. Well, probably because of uh, legal reasons <laughs> as well. But as you see with other people. But, yeah, so that kind of helped us. And now we've really just turned it into our own, and it's become more accepting, and it's more of a nostalgia act. And people, they like it, and they, they like what we've done with it. So speaking of other people who have kind of experienced that, a couple of guys that you've been working with, the Young Bucks experienced that. They they got hit with the old cease and desist. What are your thoughts on that? And you, you like I said, you've worked them a few times, House of Hardcore, Ring of Honor. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I don't know much about it. There's the whole legal side of things and you know, from my experience in uh university and college and stuff law there's so many different elements to it but the young bucks in general they're great guys great workers uh you know they, they're doing something great for the business that hasn't been seen before so i'm all on board and you know I, i'm one of their one of their fans i guess you could say i like their work it's a different style but it works and they everything they bring to the table is completely different and you know when you go into these training schools you hear the trainers say you know, don't try to reinvent the wheel because wrestling ain't going to be re reinvented, which is true. But also they try to say find something that you can do, that, that it factor that sticks out. And, you know, they, they have that. They, they can do that. And that. As you see, it's working. Now you're a regular at House of Hardcore and you're working with like the Rock and Roll Express and Bully <laughs> Ray and MVP and Tommy Dreamer. So you're a very integral part of this promotion now. How did that come about? Um, the way it came about was Dreamer just texted me one day, said, hey, are you available? And this was December 2016. And I said, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, he reminds me a lot of, I don't want to say Paul Heyman, but the style of House of Hardcore reminds me a lot of ECW. And that's when I knew that me and Mondo could just let loose and do our thing and just be what we want to be. And that was a platform that we could do it. And when we did it, it got such a great reaction that it almost turned us babyface in some ways. But it was almost like people really just – they really grasped us and they saw what we were about now. And they saw, you know, the spirit squad before you had 20 year old kids who were probably too young to be there. Not ready. Maybe work wise. We were ready, but like mentality wise and, you know, maturity, all that stuff. Nobody was really ready then, but now you see us grown. You know, it's one of those things. Had I known then what I know now. And luckily I know now what I wish I known then. You also appeared for ring of honor. How did that come about? I'm really interested in that one. <laughs> that came about uh, Mondo's good friends with Kevin Kelly. So they were discussing different things. And, you know, Mondo has his connections. I got mine. I'm, I'm more of a Paul Heyman guy. He's more of a Jim Cornette guy. And that, that's a great thing, like, to have on both ends. Yes, it is. So Mondo had that connection with Ring of Honor. 
and uh you know they kind of we got booked but then like something came up and it was just all different stuff and it ended up working out we were supposed to do something in manhattan but the way that it turned out we would have just been a backdrop for the hardy boys and the young bucks segment so it, it was kind of like a blessing in disguise that it got dropped and it got pushed off and then eventually we got that tv bit and that's when we knew like you know ring of honor is a different style it's not wwe you're not going to sit in a hold for 10 minutes not that that's bad but it's just that's not going to happen there and they expect movement and they, that's what they expect and that was our chance to shine and you know our mentality going in there working with the young bucks and i think a lot of wrestlers should really listen to this advice when you go to a new promotion you got to know who their money makers are we're not going into ring of honor as the money makers we know that the young bucks are their money makers and our first priority is to keep them safe because if they get injured, that's going to be a huge blow to Ring of Honor. And that's a different style and we have a different style and that could clash and that might not come off well. So we made it work. And then our second priority was to get over and to get them over. You know, getting them over is so hard. It's pretty easy. So yeah. <laughs> that was that kind of took care of itself. But we knew we had to still work our gimmick, but we had to do it within the same style of Ring of Honor. So this WWE return last year, I'm very interested – how that came about, how you were contacted, because let's let's be frank, you were pretty outspoken about some things that happened before, but it's not like you hadn't been back there. You had worked like a dark match in 2011, which I want to talk about later, but uh, almost out of nowhere, 2016, you and uh, Mike Mondo are back. Yeah, it was very random. Like I, you know, I went back to school, got an education. Uh, I finished, I got two master's degrees. I got an MBA and I got uh, played football too. Didn't you MSOL? Yeah. I played a year of football. I just wanted to try it. You know, it's something I always wanted to do. Um, but then, you know, so I got this good job after I graduated college I had my own office up in Boston area and stuff. And I was teaching people how to like start businesses, run businesses, which was great. I loved it. I like teaching people, but I didn't like having my own office cause I would sit there for eight hours a day and I'm like, I'm bored. I, this is crazy. Mm-hmm. So then I got a phone call one Monday. I got home from work and the phone rang and it was Mark Carano. And I was like, I didn't answer it because I thought, oh, great. They found something that I must have broken before. And like something like they <laughs> like I owe them money now, like something ridiculous. I don't know why I thought that. So then he texted me. And he said, call me as soon as possible. OK, so I called him. He said, hey, next week, can you be in San Diego for SmackDown? I said, sure, I guess so. Yeah, I'll do it. And then he's like, all right, cool. We'll send you your info. And then that was it. And then 10 minutes later, I got an email with my flight, my hotel, my rental car And I was like, did this just happen? Like, this is this a prank? So then Mondo texts me, and he's like, dude, we're going to SmackDown as a squad. And I was like, okay, let's do it. Who knows? And then every single week, or originally they said, we're going to bring you in for one week. That was it. Just that one SmackDown. That's it. Okay. And then we did it, and Vince liked it. And he came up to me afterwards, and he said, I'll see you at the pay-per-view at No Mercy. And I said, all right, I'll see you then. So then every week, we would fly home on wednesday and then thursday they would email us with our confirmation of your we need you at tv next week and we never had a contract it was just a handshake deal and it was you know even a lot of the people in the back like mike kyoto and stuff they were saying like this has never been done before like they put you guys over on the tag team champions in a non-title match you're not even under contract they're giving you a live microphone out there like there's some they trust you guys in a way because at any given point we could have said all right you know what let's just really beat up Dolph ziggler in the ring and give me the live microphone and I'll just talk trash. Like <laughs> yeah. at any point in time, that could have happened. So they, they trusted us to do business right. And we just kept doing business by them. And then one day they just stopped calling. But that's just how the business works, I guess. What kind of differences did you see over the past eight years since you had been gone? It's very laid back. Everybody, it's, it's more of a, I don't want to say it's more of a business setting because it always was, but it's just more of a, it's more laid back. People, I don't know, like when I was there, when we were coming up, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of big names there. Not that there aren't now, but there were like names from the past, like, you know, Bill DeMotts and stuff like that. Some hardcore Holly, some tough dudes. And you had to hold your own. And now it's, it's not that there aren't tough dudes. There's still tough dudes there. But it's just, you know, there's never that mentality of a dog eat dog world. It's more of just we know our part and they're trained now to know that. Where when I started in the business, it was like, you know, you got to fight for your spot. You got to do what you got to do and. Somehow you got to get there where now it's just, you know, everybody accepts their spot. And I think that's a good thing because everybody's part of the show. Even if you have to go out and wrestle and you have to lose in two minutes, you're part of that entire two hour program. And that that's your part that day. And it may not be your part all the time, but if you use your time right in that two minutes, you can slowly get yourself over. 
So you had a, a fun run there. I remember you did a lot of stuff with The Miz. Uh, now, I'm sure that when you were leaving, The Miz was in a much different place in WWE than he was when you came back. Because last year, he was one of the, still is one of the hottest acts around. And back then, he was one of the guys that you would always hear the stories getting kicked out of locker rooms and stuff. Yeah, and, but he was mostly on SmackDown. We were on Raw, so we never really saw Miz that much. We'd see him at joint pay-per-views, but, you know, he was always a nice guy. You know, he, he was always a young young person who was trying to learn more. And, you know, it, persistence pays off. Hard work pays off. So you, you had spoken out a little bit about the Mickey James, John Cena issues. Were, was there any, like, any talks with either one of those backstage? Did you run into them? How did that go? No, not really. Like when we got back there, like I've always had a, a fine conversation with uh, John. It was fine. Uh, most of our conversations really revolve around Boston sports, and yeah. you know, sometimes I sometimes I get on for you know ditching the Boston sports and <laughs> jumping to the Tampa teams. Like, how could you do such a thing? Like, it's like throwing away your baby. But uh, yeah, Mickey, we we talk every once in a while. I actually uh, when she did that match for NXT, we actually had a, just a brief conversation. I said, you know. This is your chance to like it, people who haven't seen you in however many years. Like this is your chance to just steal the show and say, you know, screw it. So whether whether that worked or didn't, who knows? Yeah, but and obviously I, she's I, doing. I, she's still doing well today. She's in a big program now. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I heard. So that's great. That's good. So you know, when everybody does good, the business does good. Better business makes the business better. That's what I always say. What's your relationship like with WDB today? Do you keep in touch with anybody there? Uh, how does that work? Yeah, occasionally I'll send an email just to let them know where we're at, what we're doing, let them know we're still busy. And, you know, we'll always get the typical reply of that's awesome, keep it up, stuff like that. And they, they don't even have to give us that. You know what I mean? So the fact that they do, that's a good thing. But, you know, yeah, a lot of people all, I guess, for- yeah, I guess that's a good thing that they reply in some way. A lot of people forget you're 31 years old. 31. 31, that's- 18 years experience. That's that's unbelievable. I mean, most of the top guys on Raw or SmackDown right now who have like fresh runs, like the Kevin Owens, the Finn Balor's, the Braun Strowman's, they're older than that now. And you've got all this experience, and you're still at a young age. Do you think that? I mean, WWE has brought back some older stars in the past too. But I mean, that's got to be something that's on your side, right? I would think so. Like it sounds really good when I hear it, or <laughs> <laughs> if I think about it, but. It hasn't paid off yet, but I'm not worried about it because I just, you know, I believe that it'll happen eventually. I mean, I'm, 18 years in the business, 31 years old, and I've already main evented pay-per-views and been in the ring with Shawn Michaels and Triple H and Show and Flair and Cena and some top names and, you know, working main event angles. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good little uh, resume there. I'm intrigued at the transition you made from one of the youngest people in WWE to the year of college football you played where you were maybe one of the older dudes on the field. Oh, yeah, I totally was. I was one of the older <laughs> guys. I was like 24 years old, which is not bad. I guess that's like what people, some of these players that have their masters in college mm-hmm. go for. So it was a different environment. It was fun. You know, it was just one of those things like I, if this is if I have the opportunity right now and I can do this, well, why not? You know, I like to play in the backyard or play pickup games. So why not give it a real approach? I played in high school, so – wasn't so bad. So uh, obviously you're remembered for that, that great spirit squad run in 2006. How do you remember being pitched that role? We were in Louisville, Kentucky, OVW, and uh, I believe Raw or SmackDown was in Cincinnati, and they said, we want a group of you guys to drive up and you have a meeting. And it was myself, Johnny Jeter, Elijah Burke, Nick Mitchell, and Nick Nemeth Ziggler there. And we went up and we met with Vince in his office and he just said, I have an idea. He said, it's going to work. He said, I want male cheerleaders. And I thought he was joking at first. And I was like looking around and I was like, is this a joke? And he was like, all right, get out of my office, make it work. And we're like, okay. (laughs) So then we just left. We just, all right, let's leave. Let's go get some outfits or something. So then like we came back, they brought us back like maybe three weeks later. And uh, then actually what happened was Elijah, he, he couldn't do it. He just said, I can't do it. And, I, you know, I respect him for that because he I was about to ask you about take. that. He, he had told me about that. Yeah, he knew what it was going to take. It was going to take some obnoxiousness and just like – and if he didn't think he could do it, that's fine because if he goes out there and tries and it doesn't work, well, then <clears throat> that could be his job. That could be our jobs. You know what I mean? So more respect to him. He, he stood his ground and he knew what he could do when he could do it and 
that's good for him. But then they opened up the role for Mike Mondo, and uh, Mike Mondo, he was always like, you know, Mondo's always it's a tough situation with that boy because like he's small, but but he's got the heart of Big Show. You know what I mean? Like the guy, yeah. he can work with anybody. He could outwork anybody. He's probably one of the best in the business, and he just never gets his due. You know what I mean? And I think WWE is looking at it as, well, why do we hire him? He's there at OVW, so I don't need to hire him if he's paying to go. That makes no sense. But it opened up a spot for him, and he took it, and he took the ball and ran with it. And then next thing you know, the squad came out and about. And there were weeks, too, where they said, you know, we might not do the Spirit Squad idea anymore. Vince isn't sure about it. And we we didn't know. You know, you never know at that part and that point. And we all were like, you know, this is our chance out of Louisville. This is our chance to actually make a mark. And maybe it's one of these gimmicks that doesn't work, but maybe it's one of these gimmicks that gets remembered for a long time. So we went to Vince's office, and we sat there. And we were like, when he comes in, we're just going to blow the air horn and do a cheer. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> and we were all set and sold on it. And then John Laurinaitis came in and was like, what, what are you guys doing? And he's like, what are, why are you in here? And we're like, we're looking for Vince. Like, we're waiting on Vince. We're going to do a cheer. He's like, he's in the production meeting. He's like, follow me. I'll show you. <laughs> okay. So then we're like, okay, this is real. Like, we're going to – Johnny Ace is now telling us, you want to do it? Here, go do it in front of everybody in the production meeting. So we just bust open the door and did the cheer. And then Vince looked up, smiled, and he said, you'll be on Raw next week. And we were like, all right, everybody out. Get out. Get out. Like, before he changes his mind. That has to be I, a giant confidence booster. Oh, God, yeah. It was crazy. And I think we, like, hid the rest of the night because we didn't want him to just see us and be like, wait, <laughs> I changed my mind. Like, yeah. you know, if they can never find you and tell you no, then it's never, it's still a yes, right? That's I guess that's – Chris Jericho tells those stories that, like, depending on how hungry Vince McMahon is, he might change his mind about something. Yeah, I read something about that. So, like, his food was actually in there. And I think Mondo <laughs> may have took a lobster tail or something like that. I don't remember exactly. So if anybody, if Vincent was ever wondering why he was missing a lobster tail in Charlotte, North Carolina, it was probably, I think Mondo took it. Had he known that, it might have cost you your jobs. Yeah, totally. We wouldn't have had as long a run. <laughs> so do you know if there was any rhyme or reason behind picking the people that were in there? Because it was a very wide array. You had someone really young in you. You had a guy with amateur wrestling experience and Dolph Ziggler who had been on TV before but pulled off. Johnny Jeter, who I know was one of Chris Canyon's favorites out of OVW, he was very highly touted. Uh, Nick Mitchell from Tough Enough. And then Mike Mondo, who was a little smaller than everybody, but I think that that added to the group, having him and seeing like the size contrast there. Like, Do you know if there was any rhyme or reason there? I don't know the rhyme or reason. The one thing that I do know, or the two things that I do know, is one, Nick Mitchell was chosen because they realized – this kid has no idea about wrestling. He doesn't know the history of wrestling. He tried out because he wanted to win a million-dollar contract. I get it. Anybody would do so. And he's just really, really entertaining. So he fit the gimmick, like, to a T. I think the gimmick may have been built around him. Just like he's the butt so, scoot, right? Yeah, yeah. He's so obnoxious. And it was just like you, you couldn't help but laugh at him. And then uh, myself and Mondo, eventually, were, Vince, we were chosen because we were the tag team that would wrestle on TV and pay-per-views. Like, we were the – pay-per-view and tag team champions and on the house shows the other guys could get more experience not that they weren't as good but i guess in vince's mind that's what he wanted he wanted me and mondo being the guys on the tv doing the wrestling matches so have you seen nick mitchell recently i haven't i i know that well but uh probably about a year and a half ago i talked to him he's pretty jacked up from what i saw he's tattooed he was doing some mma stuff and yeah, unfortunately for him, he did one fight and he ran into a guy who is now a top 10 UFC heavyweight. Wow, look at that. So at least he had, yeah, yeah. maybe he was the launch for that guy, right? Yeah, it was, it was both of their first pro fights, so who would have known? But right. now that guy, he's literally fighting this weekend on pay-per-view and <laughs> was awesome. about one win, one win away from a UFC heavyweight fight. And, it, and I don't know that Nick ever fought again. And maybe after running into that guy, you might not want to. But looking back, you'd probably be like, Okay, not so bad. Yeah, right. Not yeah, so that's bad. not a bad thing at all. That's that's something to hang your hat on. Like I went toe to toe with that guy. I don't know how yeah. long Nick lasted, but lasted two rounds, and most UFC or a couple of UFC guys didn't make it out of the out of the first with with this guy. So, so well, yeah. I'm sure he's gotten better over time. But that is a good thing to say. You know what I mean? So maybe Mitchell should get back in there. Yeah, I mean this guy beat up uh, Ronda Rousey's husband pretty bad. So there's that. Wow, yeah, that's pretty good, and he he can beat up his fair share of. People. Yeah, yeah. Beat Roy I Nelson, have... beat uh, uh, all kinds of people. So, yeah, and it's always intriguing to see where people go after the wrestling business. And uh, I remember when when 
the word got out that Nick Mitchell was going to try MMA, I was like, yeah, why not? Why not? Yeah. Why not? You know what I mean? Like, you got to try other stuff. There, there's more to the world than wrestling. And, you know, you learn that when you get out of the business or when you stop for a little bit. There, there's so much more out there. People don't know half the stuff, you know? Hey, that's something I wanted to ask you about, too. The Cindy Margolis show. Yeah. How was that? That was a great show. That was awesome. Uh, my buddy, Andrew Glassman, he, he was the producer. And he does, like, you know, Glassman Media stuff in L.A., and he was like, I have this opportunity for you. I think you might, you know, might be interested in it. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, I just wanted to go and have fun. Like, this is great. It's a, you know, it's a paid gig. I'll go live in a mansion for three weeks. And it was like living in a frat house. And then you get to like mess around with Cindy Margolis that time. So <laughs> it was great. And I totally, you know what it is? I totally worked the wrestling gimmick in there. And like, they had no idea. I would play pranks and like, they do the reality camera, the confession camera. And I would put over the fact that I was going to play a prank on somebody. And then eventually I would do the prank and I would like make it look like somebody else did it. And then I would <laughs> tease about my next prank that I was going to do. And I just knew that the producers were like, we got to keep this guy because he's entertaining and he's creating conflict. And he's like, it's just random stuff. But it was a great time. It was a great opportunity. I would totally do it again. I would totally go live in a mansion with a bunch of cool people for three weeks. She had a pro wrestling connection for a little while. I know WWE liked her a lot in like 99, 2000 because of the UPN connection and all that. Um, you also, around that time, worked a dark match against Justin Gabriel, 2011. What was that like? What kind of feedback did you get? Uh, that was great. It was actually, actually kind of weird at first because he's like, hey, man, I used to watch you as growing up. And I was like, I'm, we're the same age. I yeah. Think. Like, no, no, no. Like, he didn't, no, I was here. We were both the same age. But it was a great match. It was uh, got great feedback. And it's like, I don't want to say that they mess with you on purpose because they don't. I don't think they mean to. But like there were like agents in the back like, oh, wow, that's great. Like, I can't believe it. You're going to be back and all this stuff. And I was like, wait, where are you guys getting this information? Like, no one's telling me this. And then John Lornez pulled me in his office. He's like, you have nothing that I want. I'm not interested, blah, blah, blah. And I was wow. like, uh, wow, OK. <laughs> I was like, that's so weird. I said on the way here, like to your office, I heard like everything opposite of that. And he's like, well, they don't do the hiring or firing. Uh, but whatever. If you didn't see anything then, that's fine. I'll come back. I'll change. Don't worry about it. I got it. Did and you happen to he, see him when you came back last year? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. He's still there. And did you all talk or anything? Yeah. Well, like, I mean, I never take anything that they say offensive. It's business. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like if you're a pro football player and, and they don't want you to be the start and left tackle, they're going to say, you're yeah, not the start and left tackle. Not yeah. today. Somebody else is. But – I think when you take it to heart like that, that's what makes people get bitter in the business or they, they don't like the business. And, you know, I actually, I do some of these signings and stuff and some of these independent shows and you hear about guys getting tryouts and ask them how to go. And sometimes you could hear it in their voice. Like, they're just like, Oh man, like it was a huge letdown, I think. And, but it is what it is because you go in with high expectations and you know, the effort and dedication that you put into this in your heart and you feel sometimes they don't see it. And whether they see it or they don't, it's irrelevant, but it's just what they need at that time. You know, timing can be a, a big difference in wrestling. When I think of Johnny Ace, I think of how weird it's going to be when all the marriages are done, that Road Warrior Animal is going to be related to like the Bella, the Bella twins and Daniel Bryan's kid and Cena's kid. It's like, right? They're starting their own like Northeastern dynasty, like the Samoan dynasty, like here. Like it's, it's going to, it's yeah, gonna what be are their they going to call that? I don't know. That's weird. So, Who's bringing what to Thanksgiving? That's what I want to Yeah. Know. So uh, as we as we wind down, I wanted to talk about like maybe the end of your run or, or the end of Spirit Squad. Almost everybody was sent to OVW but you. Was there like any resentment there? Um, I don't think so. I Actually, I asked not to go back on TV the following week just because you can't you can't be a male cheerleader for a whole year. And then come back next week and you're not a male cheerleader anymore and expect people to go, oh, that he graduated. Well, yeah, but there was never a graduation. The graduation <laughs> was next week. I come out and get super kicked again, which happened the week before. <laughs> they could have had Lanny Poffo come out there and hand you your diploma or something. Yeah, we could have did a little better. You know, maybe Clarence Mason files a lawsuit or something. Yeah. Seems to be the thing, right? But – no, I was like, man, this is going to be tough because, like, it's uh, – I don't know that I'm going to get a fair shake at all this because it's – I don't think – not that I won't get a fair shake. The crowd isn't going to give you the fair opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They need to 
And that's just how wrestling works. Sometimes you got to pull yourself away and they have to forget about you. And then when you come back, that's your, it's like first opportunity again. It's hard to get another first opportunity, but when you do, that's where you have to make it work. And I think that worked this past time with the squad because I came back in competition shape and people were like, oh, wow, look at this guy. He's like, yeah. he can still go. So when you were released, you were 22. What did what mentally did that do for you? Because, I mean, you were young. You knew that you had a long future in pro wrestling still. Um, I just started writing out my goals. What are my goals beside pro wrestling? Because, you know, whether you're 22 or 42 or 52 or 62, at some point it's going to end. I just knew it wasn't going to end at 22, but I also knew this was my opportunity. I knew that it wasn't going to pick right back up at 22 because once, you, once you're released, they're not going to turn around and rehire you unless they made a mistake, and they very rarely don't do that too often. So I just made a list of goals, and college was one of them. You know, start a small business and, you know, just fend for yourself. I, I, the reason I got into pro wrestling at 13 was because I, I always feared people going to work 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, and I was like, I don't know why people do this. And I would ask my mom, like, why, why do you do that? That makes no sense at all. You don't like it. Stop going. And she said, well, you got to pay the bill somehow. And I thought, well, I got to figure out how to pay the bills by not doing that. So that was my plan. You seemed like the kind of guy a TNA would be interested in. You were young. You were a big dude. You had WWE experience. Did they ever reach out? I did a dark match with them. I worked homicide. Oh, here's what happened with TNA. Uh, yes, actually, they did. Um, they brought me down. They flew me down, put me in a hotel. They paid me to work a dark match. I worked homicide. They liked it. I went out after with Bischoff and Flair, and Flair was like, you got to hire this kid. You got to hire this kid. We need him here. And then a week and a half later. They seem to like you an awful lot. I guess, right? I, you never know. Sometimes <laughs> you never know, right? I always, every time I see him, I still feel like I need to introduce him as, hi, I'm, I'm Ken. Nice to meet you. I'm a yeah. big fan. Like, and it, oh, I know who you are. Like, okay, just making sure. Like, you don't have to know who I am, Rick. Just, just so you know. Like, if you forget, that's okay. But they brought me down, and then a week and a half later, they said, we want you to come back down for another dark match. And I said, okay, cool. Just send me my information. And then they said, well, well you got to pay for your own flight and your own hotel and all that stuff. Mm. And I, I just thought – and they said, you're going to work for free. And I, I just said, you know, at this point in my career, it's not something that I, I care to do at this point in life. Like I have a, a lot of other projects going that I'm not going to put those off just to try to do this for you guys. You know – can I send you a YouTube clip of like me and Shawn Michaels or something? And maybe that, you <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't say that, but that's what I was thinking. And then like yeah. uh, about a week later, they offered me a deal. And then the deal was, the, the guarantee was so low that, and by the way, I'm always thinking of things like business wise. And like, that's just the, my mentality all the time. And after being with WWE, I know what it costs to rent a car. I know what it costs mm -hmm. to get a hotel. So when I broke down their deal, I broke it down and they were still doing house shows. So I emailed them back nicely and I said, let's assume that I do your house shows Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever. With the cost of me renting a car, the cost of me renting a hotel, the cost of me eating three times a day, and then your pay on top of that, my take home is going to be about $200 a week. That yeah. I, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to be a homeless TV star. You know what I mean? I'd rather yeah. not be on TV and be able to live. So I just respectfully declined their, their offer. That's but interesting. as that was... of recent, I haven't – no, we haven't heard anything. One of my favorite things that you did outside WWE was the Chikara King of Trios in 2014. I've always loved that tournament because they do stuff like this. Oh, they, yeah, brought, that's great. they brought you, Johnny, and Mikey in. Now, the same tournament, they also had LAX. They've had like teams called the Cold Front. Well, they'll, br they'll bring in like Al Snow, Ice Train, and Glacier. Like they, <laughs> they have these awesome pairings that they do all the time team ring of honor team wwf how, how does that come about and did it take any convincing of any of the other guys to do it or yourself no me and mondo have always like been set on and we're still set on like there's no doubt in our mind that we're going to be back and we're going to make it on some level whether it be ring of honor or tna impact force wrestling or wwe or if house to hardcore even gets a big deal you never know but that's our mentality. But then it wasn't anything crazy. Uh, actually, I guess the only person that we had to talk a little bit was Jeter, Johnny Jeter. And we were like, dude, just come on down. It'll be fine. It's a six-man tag. And his concern was that he hadn't been in the ring for eight years. And, you know, a six-man tag, we can always hide your weaknesses. We will showcase your strengths, and that's, that's all we'll do. And you'll be all right. 
also you were part of Wrestling Retribution Project, which didn't end up working out, but they, they changed your name. There was a lot of weird stuff about that. What do you remember about that situation? I remember it being very strange, and I remember the crowd being hired, I guess, as extras. So it became more of me like, how can I get this crowd to react differently than they're supposed to react? Yeah. And it became more of a rib in a way. Not that the show was a rib. The show was great. It was a, it was a great idea, interesting idea to take it differently. But the one thing that I really remember a lot of is we did a battle royal and Chris Masters was in there. And I remember I like gave him like a half Nelson and then with the other arm I gave him a few shots to the rib and then I snuck in and gave him the, the shoot full Nelson and I hooked it as tight as I could and I started shaking him all about. And then you could hear because Lance Storm and I think Chris Daniels were the two agents that, that you didn't see on camera. You, I could hear them laughing hysterically. <laughs> And the crowd was just like, what do we do? Like, and he was like squirming. He's like, oh, no, you didn't. So then he's like chasing me around the Battle Royal the rest of the match because I put him in the shoot master lock. But he, he knows how to break it, obviously. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that, that project didn't end up working out as planned. I know Jeff Katz got a lot of criticism in regards to that. Were you all updated or anything about the status of that as it didn't air? No, no. We, uh, we got paid for it, so that was great. We had a good week in L.A., and it was fun. And, uh, you know, I respect him for trying. He tried something new. You know, sometimes if you have a dream or you have a goal or something, you just got to try it. And if you don't succeed and you fail, well, you tried. You know what I mean? At least you yeah. didn't sit there and go, well, look what I have on paper. Okay, yeah, but you didn't try it yet. And the last thing I wanted to ask you, you worked a ton of dark matches and, uh, like, velocity and heat and things like that. Before your time in the Spirit Squad, I mean, you're working like Tajiri, Caprice Coleman on dark matches. You were part of the White Boy Challenge. You, <laughs> yeah. You wrestled Val Venus, Lance Storm, Billy Gunn, Hardcore Holly, Gold Dust, and I'm pretty sure you were underage there. Yep. Uh, what kind of Absolutely. experience did, did that give you, and what kind of feedback did you get from that? And what was it like being out there almost in a modern era, not 18 years old probably? Yeah, it was different, man. It was, it was, uh, I went to a Dr. Tom camp at 16 and then actually I just got my license. So I was allowed to go drive myself there. So I went and Dr. Tom knew my age, but then like a week later I got a call. I got home from school as a junior in high school and my mom, she was like some doctor from Connecticut called for you. And I was like, what? She's like, what's going on? What are you not telling me? And I was like, what? That doctor? And then, like, I listened to the message. It was Dr. Tom. And so then he was like, can you be in Philadelphia and Baltimore next Monday, Tuesday? And I, all right. So I went there. And then I just – he told me, you know, lie about your age. Just minus two years off your date of birth. Okay. So I did. And then uh, – so then I had always worked independence with Sergeant Slaughter a lot. And Slaughter was the guy who was booking the dark match guys. So when he saw me, he was like, dude, you're going to be on TV every week that you're here. He's like, I'm going to put you in that spotlight. He's like, make sure you can do it. And I was like, I got you. And my first one was Rodney Mack, and then it was like, you know, Sunday Night Heat. So I was very fortunate that I had Dr. Tom looking out for me and guys like Sergeant Slaughter. And all. And you know what, though? That doesn't come from just being randomly selected either. Some people think, like, you get given opportunities. No, you earn them. And they saw in my work and my attitude and everything that I have what it takes to be there. And even at 16, they had faith in it, and Dr. Tom had faith. And I, you know, I, I didn't drop the ball there. I kept carrying it. But I would get great feedback. I remember Jim Ross after I worked Lance Storm on Heat because he said we had four minutes, and then we got to the curtain. He goes, "You got nine minutes." And Lance Storm just looked at me. He goes, "Okay, we'll talk out there." And I was like, "You talk, I'll listen." Like I, I'm not gonna call much, man. Like you're 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 the ring general here. But then afterwards, Jim Ross he said, "Is this what you want to do for a living?" And I said, "Yeah, absolutely." And he's like, "All right, just making sure. Just want to check." And I was like, oh, "That must be good, right?" I don't know. Yeah. So anything else that you uh, have to or let the people know where they can follow you on social media, where people can contact you for booking, stuff like that? Yeah, definitely my Instagram at Ken Doan, K-E-N-N-D-O-A-N-E. My Twitter, same thing, at K-E-N-N-D-O-A-N-E. -E. Uh, my Twitter, Instagram has booking information for those who want to book me. We've been doing a lot of stuff with the squad lately. We're booked every weekend up until Christmas now. Uh, we're going to, geez, Germany, Jersey, uh, Canada. Wisconsin, we got House of Hardcore coming up. You know, I we we go on the House of Hardcore. We're, I'm telling you, man, this business is uh, people. Everybody wants to be the star of the show, right? 
star. That big star has to fight somebody. There has to be an Ivan Drago. There has to be a Clubber Lang. Not a lot of people are trying for that position to be the top heel. And that's what me and Mondo do. We're the squad. We know at the end of the night we're going to be laying there and people are going to be counting to three, but that crowd's going to react. And they need that. They need the heels to get that reaction. So you can always get yourself in the main events that way. Be a good heel, sell, bump and feed. It's okay to sell. It's okay to sell for each other. But that, that's pretty much what we do now. So, and, uh, you know, we'll ruffle a few feathers here and there through Twitter. Get <laughs> people a little irritated. We do pretty good. We've been starting our own little Twitter beefs, but we pay them off. You know, I started a little beef the other week with Global Force and uh, Jeremy Borash, but, you know, it, I this past weekend when Rosemary strangled me. So 